welcome back to my channel it's been a long time since i've done uh a bit an equipment talk so i figured it was about time to do an update just in case some of my views have changed since the last one i really don't re-watch my old videos because i hate listening to the sound of my voice so i haven't looked back on it to confirm if it conflicts or not but i have had a lot of changes in perception since i made that so i figured it was about time to do a new one and i also made a very exciting purchase that will make this video a lot more fun in my opinion um, and yes, technically it is a horse. No, it is not what you were thinking. I will show you. This is my friend, Doornail. Uh, I call him Doornail because he is as dead as one. Um, I was told by the guy I bought him from that he believed the person he got it from said it was from a thoroughbred. The head is quite small, so I'm wondering if it was more like a quarter horse type or just a very petite little thoroughbred. Either way, it's pretty cool. Um, the skull is in amazing condition, and I'm really looking forward to using it to show tack and equipment stuff. Um, this bridle slid around a little bit, so I'll fix it after, and then I can show you too. But I'm going to be using him to kind of demonstrate what I'm talking about with the nose bands in specific. However, I will be doing this video in a couple of parts because... I don't have all of the equipment that I would like to show. A lot of the stuff that I no longer use or agree with, I have gotten rid of. So I do not have it to show how it would act directly on the face of the horse. So I'm in the process of getting like all of the equipment that I don't like to show. So I'm going to show some stuff that I have and just talk about the differences between nose bends and some of my concerns with the nose bends that I do have to show. However, I don't have like a drop nose bend or the Micklin bridle and stuff like that. And I really would like to have those to show people. So I'm working on getting some but since I don't use them I don't really want to pay full price for them of course so if anyone has like any old tack like gnarly bits um, nose bends and flash nose bends and stuff that they don't use I'll be looking for stuff like that ideally in doornail size because it's easier to um, it's easier to uh, fit to him then he is about a cob or a pony size and he can fit full it's just a bit big on him because he has no flesh um, so that would be great if anyone has stuff that they wouldn't mind like donating. Uh, I'm looking just to kind of slowly build the collection so that I can show people. Um, and yeah, I figured this would be a neat way of doing it because it gives you a really clear perception of uh, how the horse's face actually looks. And it's pretty shocking, like even to me, being around horses as long as I have and having had horses as long as I had and having studied equine sciences, I was blown away by how sharp the cheekbones are. They're really, really sharp, and the bars of the mouth are also like little razor blades. So what I'm going to check with my vet when I get my horse's teeth done in February is whether or not this is wear from a bit on the bars of the mouth, or if this is like regularly how the bars are. And then I'll also get some shots of my horse's mouths when they're getting their teeth done, and I'll compare it to this guy so that people can see how the soft tissues act in the mouth. So I have some big plans featuring Doornail, and he's going to be around a lot, so I hope that people find this interesting. I know some people find skulls creepy and gross, but I do think that it is important to show this just to give you a real idea of like what's going on under the surface of your horse and how certain things react and affect them. People are probably wondering why I decided that this was a he. So these teeth right here, like these two little sticky outy guys, one, two, and then there's two on this side as well, one, two. They're called canine teeth and Basically all geldings and stallions will get them, but only like 30% of mares get them. So there's a very high chance that this horse is male. So I'm just calling him a him. Not that it really matters. Um, and yeah, he is missing a tooth. I do have the tooth. It just keeps falling out. So I have to glue it back in. Um, his mouth is interesting because he does have some abnormalities. As you can see, this tooth grew in completely on an angle. And then he has some calcification on the outside here because of that. And I would imagine this wasn't particularly comfortable in a living horse. So that's why I would have loved to have known his history a little bit more as a riding horse so that I could say um, whether or not he was ridden or what he did. Um, but yeah, that calcification buildup doesn't look particularly comfortable. And it definitely has changed how he was able to chew um, and set his mouth so especially in the front so interesting I wondered if it was like something he was born with or if it's something related to how the tooth grew in or if the tooth grew in because of something else but we will not know because I don't know his history but this gives you like an idea of the horse's face this skull is quite heavy it's probably like I don't know 20 pounds um, and how thin the nasal bone is. This is the bone that a lot of nose bands sit on, especially dropped nose bands, flash nose bands, and anything that is like made to go in front of the bit um, to close the mouth more. And as you can see, let's see, I can move it with my finger. And it's stronger than it looks because it is very thin. 
but I'm flexing it by pushing down on it with my finger. And the higher you go up on this bone, the stronger it is. This little part here is the most delicate part. So again, let's flex it. And unfortunately, this is where a lot of people's nose men sit. And it's even worse when you over tighten them because then when the horse opens their mouth, they can tighten it and push down on it even more because they're hitting something constantly. Um, and of course, in a living horse, there'd be a lot of soft tissues like cartilage and stuff in here, but the cartilage is a lot easier to damage than bone. And even the bone you can damage. Um, so it's a consideration to make for sure when you're picking equipment, because I think people really underestimate how fragile that nasal bone is. Like it is very, very thin. Unfortunately, a lot of the equipment that we use kind of capitalizes off of using that to form discomfort. Okay. So basically what I am going to do is I'm going to put some bridles onto Dornail's head and then I'll talk about the choices of bridles and kind of also about the bridles that I've created and why I decided to create them the way I did um, because it was very much related to the anatomy. So I'm really happy I found this guy. I found him on Craigslist. Second horse I got off of Craigslist. I bought Dallas off of Craigslist way back in the day. I think like eight years ago now it was. Long, long time. Almost, yeah, eight years ago. Wow. Almost nine. Um, long time. So I'm just going to put some bridles onto Dornell's face so that I can describe the action of them and go from there. Um, the first one I'm going to start with is just a traditional hunter bridle. Just a normal little guy. Um, this is probably the most common type of nose bend that you'll see. This one's nicer though because it does have the padded mono crown, um, crown piece with some space for the ears. Like there's a very minimal cutout for the ears you can see. Very subtle. Um, and... It does have a flash loop and I would love to put a flash on, but I do not have a flash. So maybe I'll go grab some string just to kind of show you where the flash would go. Um, this is like the most common type of English bridle that you will see with or without the flash loop is just the regular Cavisson nose band. Um, like I said, I would recommend getting a padded monocrown like this. I'll show you what the alternative is. Um, more companies are doing monocrowns like this though than the other type now. So I would say you're probably most likely to find one like this, but yeah, we'll see. So now you can see, like like I said, Doornail's head is more of a cob size and this bridle's a full. So I'm just going to pull it back a little bit so that it'll sit up like that. Um, here. And this one has no, like the throat latch won't even fit in. Of course, like a regular horse is fleshy and then they'll have their ears and stuff that will hold it. But this gives you a better idea of it. Since it's too big for him, I haven't put a bit on it. But the bit hangers would come down and then the bit would come into the mouth like that. And yeah, so you want your Cavison nose bend set higher up because if it's too low, then it's going to rest on this. And I'll lower it on purpose um, after, but I just wanted to show it cor cor correctly placed. Um, the reason why anatomical bridles leave room for these cheek pieces is because when you do have a bit attached, there is the possibility of stuff like rubbing against it like that. Um, and then let me show you, like, people think that these don't stop the horse from opening their mouth as much, but let me show you. Like, yes, he can still open the front part of his mouth, but look at how that restricts the jaw. And this is with the nose bend in the correct place and look at how loose it is most people don't even fit their nose bands this loose but look at how much it restricts the jaw Let's see and then he goes and like i said this is not very tight but it does show how restrictive it is so even in a regular cavisson nose band if you have your horse in a harsher type of bit and you're pulling on them and they want to evade the bit pressure this is all they can do so the bit could be poking them in the roof of the mouth it could still be rubbing against the bars in their mouth and they have no real escape even in these okay so now i've lowered it more and since this bridle is too big for him it's hard to get it tight but this shows how tight it is there we go. You do not want your bridle to be sitting ideally. Like this is right on the edge of the nose. Like a dropped nose bend would be sitting kind of 
around here, which I don't have because I've gotten rid of all of them. And then let me just hold these because it's not tight enough to like... Yeah, so he can barely open his front teeth. This is why so many horses in flashes just go like this because they can't open those jaws. They just clench and expose their teeth. And then if you want to take it a step further and put it down even lower and then like really crank it, let's pretend, oh my God, sorry, doornail. Let's really crank it. I'm going to bring this back into his mouth so that I can hold it tight. Okay, so I've tightened it. Like if I was riding a horse and I didn't want them to open their mouth and I was just using a nose bend to stop it, I would do it up tighter like this. And now look barely any movement and then also like if you can see it presses down and flexes that bone and like I said this bone is a lot stronger than it looks but it's poorly protected and a lot of the fragile cartilage that's in that area for a living horse that is easily damaged so this is why you don't want your nose bend to sit this low and I also want to add like any dropped nose bend or like flash type nose bend, they're made to go in front of the bit. You buckle them in front of the bit, which means by default, you need to be setting up the buckle to be going in front of the bit, which is like right around here. So it's quite a bit lower. So realistically, like it's very hard to do that without it having affect this little nasal bone here. Um, and like in my opinion with flash type nose bends and drop type nose bends like trying to force the horse to close their mouth if they're grinding their teeth a lot or opening and closing their mouth a lot it's not actually addressing the problem of why they are doing that it's just forcing them to not be able to do it and usually it's like anxiety related pain related they're still learning how to deal with the bit in their mouth and how to respond to aids and then people strap on these types of equipment to effectively take away that ability from them and I don't think any of us realize how stressful it actually would be to have your jaw essentially wired shut. Like if you don't have autonomy to be able to open and close your mouth, it is very stressful. Um, so I don't think we should be doing that to animals personally. Um, like I don't know if anyone's ever broken their jaw and had it wired shut. I would imagine it would be similar stress to that despite like other than the fact that your jaw would hurt more if it was broken but it is distressing to not have the control to do it. So the thing is, even if your horse in theory, like you have a nicely fitted brow nose band and it's not pushing down on this bone too much, but your horse is having difficulty being able to like move their mouth around and stuff, whether or not you think it is worst case scenario, doesn't really matter because you're the one that's in control of the situation. So to you, it is gonna be less distressing by default because you are in control. The horse is not. Having that control removed is what makes the entire situation scarier for the animal because they have no means of rectifying the situation. So that autonomy is actually rather important. And I think that we need to reevaluate the equipment we're putting on our horses. Like if you're gonna ride in a bit, it should be done so with the understanding that the goal is to get your horse soft and listening in a bit and soft in the jaw so that you don't need to strap their mouth shut with a flash. And I know a lot of people are like, oh, well, we don't do it up very tight. But like, as I've shown you with this one, even with the two fingers on it, it doesn't matter. This is even without a flash on with the two fingers, the horse struggled to open its mouth. Now imagine if I added a flash piece, I'll go get something. Okay, so I have put the bridle back on in the regular position. As you can see, it's very loose. I'm going to try to hold it back here a little bit because like I said, it is not fitting him properly. So I have a shoelace. I'm going to run it through the flash nose band. I'm going to hold this headpiece back because we'll pretend that he has ears. And then we'll loop this around here. And so the problem with a flash nose band is that even if your nose band is loosely fitted, like it does pull it down when you tighten it. So I'm going to try to do this. So we're pretending that we have a flash on. So not only I showed you how restricted even just the regular Cavasson nose band would be. And then now look, it can barely, like this is why a lot of horses and flashes will just start grinding their teeth. Cause watch, they can go side to side. But then when they try to open it, like if the bridle's fitted properly, like he has ears. barely can open it. So that's why I don't like flashes. 
so obviously that's not a real flash it's a shoelace so i understand it's not going to be the same action and this bridle doesn't fit in properly however that shows how restrictive it is especially when you pair it with a regular cabasson noseband in my opinion if you need to use a flash it is probably kinder to the horse to use something like a figure eight because it doesn't have the same effect as strapping right underneath um, the jaw where their cheekbones are like where all their molars are and then right here um, where the front part of their mouth is. It makes it next to impossible for them to open and close their mouth at all, um, which I don't think is very kind because like I said, like autonomy is very important. Um, when you have that option of being able to freely open and close your mouth and move it around, take it away from you, it is distressing. Like even for people, if you had your jaw wired shut or if someone like for whatever reason did something that made you unable to open and close your mouth properly, like stitching your mouth shut, you would panic and you'd probably feel like you couldn't breathe even though you can breathe through your mouth. Um, and that's like the difference between an autonomous decision and one that is forced because if you're the one in control of the decision by default you're going to feel better about it because you can control when it comes off and it's not going to be scary to you so you as a rider might feel that this type of equipment is totally fine and good but I just want to be clear about how it could be impacting your horse because how you feel as the rider ultimately doesn't matter when we're talking about how the horse feels and the horse's welfare and what is most fair to them. So while it might be nice to get your horse to stop opening their mouth as much right away and it might be quicker to slap the flash on than it would be to work on the anxiety or why whatever is causing them to chew aggressively, it might be easier to do that to your horse. It is just shutting down the behavior by making it not an option and not dealing with the underlying cause, which can be very distressing. Okay, so this next bridle we're putting on is one of the ones from my store. It's the Milestone um, Harlow bridle, the bitted bridle that I have. Okay, so this bridle is the Milestone Harlow bridle. It's the one from my store. This size is too big for poor little doornail. Um, so I can't get it up tight enough, but this shows how it's supposed to be fitted more or less um, and how it leaves more room for the cheekbones. So as you can see, like compared to the regular cabasson, it would sit up a little higher on like a flesh horse, so more like right there. But as you can see for a horse that is having flesh, skin and muscle, it avoids these super ultra sharp cheekbones a lot. And I'll show you after just how sharp these bad boys are at a different angle that'll be more clear. But yeah, you can see the cutout for the cheekbones. And then the other clear difference is, okay. And then the other clear difference is where this part of the underside of the noseband connects. Notice how much further back this is. Um, the purpose of this is to keep the bridle off of the noseband off of the face more. So it's not to be restrictive. The noseband on this type of bridle is more for an aesthetic feature than anything else. Um, and yeah, so it leaves more room for the cheekbones and then look at how much more the mouth can open as a result. And the difference is honestly, largely it's the attachment point of the underside of this. The fact that it's further back means that it's not restricting directly at the front of their molars anymore. So way more movement of the mouth, way more movement of the mouth. And this bit is way too big for doornail. Um, but this is a leather boche from Sweet Billy's Bits. So the entire reason why I decided to make this bridle was because I wanted an anatomical type of bridle like this and I'd been looking around to find one and I realized that most of these ones usually have a flash noseband that comes down or they'll do it like this but they'll make it a drop style noseband to fasten in front of the bit rather than behind it. Um, and then it's much more restrictive to the mouth. So I was like, okay, great that they're doing anatomical stuff, but then they're still trying to strap the mouth shut, which in my opinion defeats the purpose of it. Like you're still like, you're trying to make your horse more comfortable, but then you're still taking their comfort away. Um, so I was frustrated by that. And I was also looking around at the prices, trying to find one like this. And a lot of the places that I could find without a flash were like $600. And I was like, okay, like that's not attainable for most people. That's insane. I wouldn't spend $600 on a bridle. So I was like, okay, let's see if I can develop something myself that I feel good about for using on my horses. And that is also cheaper for people if they so choose to use them on their horses. Like honestly, whether or not these bridle designs took off for me selling them, I would still keep using them on my horses because I first and foremost am inventing stuff to use in my training program on my horses that I feel good about. Um, and the fact that people liked them was a bonus and I tried to make them really well priced which is why they're at like the $150 Canadian mark or $120 US 
which quite frankly is like unheard of in the bridal world. And I'm not saying this to toot my own horn. I'm saying it because now that I've looked into the manufacturing side of things, I can tell you without question that the markup on a lot of the companies, the big name companies that you're buying from is astronomical because they're buying huge minimum order quantity sizes, which allows them to save more money simply from that. And they're selling like huge inventories. So they could afford to charge you less, but they just choose not to because that's how elitist the horse world is. Um, on the other hand, as a singular entity who's putting all of my own capital into buying these, it has to do smaller orders because I cannot afford to do large ones. As a single person with no investors, if I can afford to make them more affordable, the rest of the horse industry can. They just don't fucking want to. So that's kind of my pet peeve, my rant for the day. So anyways, the neat thing about bits like this is that they can mold to the mouth because they, once they get warm, they are way more flexible and then it's softer on the horse's bars and a lot harder to abuse than a traditional metal bit. Uh, so these are really good bits. I like the leather bits. They can chew through them. So if your horse is a heavy chewer, you might need to replace this more and you should always check it before riding to make sure because there is no thin metal core in this bit. So it can be more dangerous for heavy chewers. If you have a horse that chews a lot, if they go well in this bit, they should probably chew less. However, some horses like the taste of leather and they'll chew on it more. So if that's the case, be really careful. Always check your tack and just make sure that you're being safe. Um, however, I think that these are great because of the fact that they don't have a thin metal core, it makes them more flexible. Um, and then that way too, if your horse does chew through it, it's not like you have a serrated, not, not that they're actually serrated, but a really thin wire that could be rubbing against their mouth before you realize. So it's not a bad thing, but they can be chewed through and I want to reiterate that. So like replacing them and like the upkeep cost of having them could be higher than with another bit. But yeah, interesting comparison to how much the mouth can open in this versus the regular cabasson, even without the flash on. And I think to me, it was eye opening. The difference between like my bridle and the cabasson bridle in terms of how the horse was able to open their mouth honestly shocked me. I wasn't expecting it to be that much of a difference. And I'll be completely honest with that. So the fact that it is, I guess it's good for me from a marketing perspective, but it surprised me because I thought that the cabasson bridle is allowed for more freedom of the mouth. And I was actually pretty surprised to see it. And it's a lot harder to see once it's on on your horse because you can't control when they open and close their mouth in the same way and you can't feel the resistance um, in the same way as when you're opening and closing the jaw of a skull. So it gave me more insight and it has reiterated the fact to me that if I'm going to use a regular cabasson noseband, I'm going to be really careful about how I fit it because I will probably be doing way more than the two finger rule because the two finger rule is not sufficient in my opinion after seeing this. Okay, before we put more stuff on doornail, I'm going to show you some bits that I have. Some of these are unused. Um, so we'll show them. And some of them are very dirty because I stopped using them and then never cleaned them, especially the leather bits. So don't be like me. So this is almost my entire bit collection. And a lot of these I haven't been using regularly because I have my favorites that are already on the bridles that are almost identical mouthpieces, just different cheek pieces. So I'll explain that in a second. So this is basically my entire bit collection. Some of these have never been used and a lot of them I haven't been using actively. They've just been sitting and collecting dust in the bottom of my tack trunk, which is why they're so dirty and gross. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about these. I have favorite ones that are in the regular rotation that are down at the barn now because of that, but they're basically the same mouthpieces with different cheek pieces. So I will just explain. So this is one I've never used before and I'm sure the one that people would start having the most questions about, it's a foam bit completely flexible. I've never used it because I feel like the foam would irritate a lot of horses because it smells weird and the taste of it probably. It's like a sponge material. However, I've heard that a lot of people like this one for horses who have mouth injuries. It is very flexible, but I would just personally prefer using a leather bit. I haven't tried it on a horse yet though. I will do that soon. Um, and then I will let people know. Um, this is another leather bit. This is where you can kind of see the chewing damage right there. A horse that was a heavy chewer used this one, but it's still like okay to use. You just have to keep an eye on that. Like if you're riding in a horse that chews heavily each ride, I wouldn't ride in this one. But that kind of shows the damage that can be done. This one I don't like as much because of the stitching but right there. It's more abrasive, even though it's not going to be directly against the bars because of how it sits. Um, it's also like not natural leather. This leather was stained. I wouldn't recommend getting one like this. 
I prefer the Sweet Billy's bits, leather bits, like the one I showed you on the other one. This is another one from Sweet Billy's. This is just not their rolled leather bit. I like the rolled leather better than these flat leather bits because I find that they're less abrasive on the mouth. And I also got some of my bits custom from Sweet Billy's because their rolled leathers um, are quite thin if you don't go the custom route. This one has the chin piece because it's designed to be ridden without a bridle if you would like to. Um, same thing, when it gets really warm, it is way more flexible, but as you can see, it's quite flexible as is. I just wouldn't practice, practice flexing them a ton when they're dry because you can break the leather easier. This is one of my older trust bits. I don't use this one as much because I got a new one. Um, and this is the Trust Innosense bit with the D-ring. And as you can see, it's a very, very flexible rubber. This one does have a very thin metal core. Um, I used this one for years, and that's the current damage on it, as you can see. Um, it's still usable. I just started using the other one because it was a slightly smaller mouthpiece that fitted my horse better. Um, but I really like these bits. This is one of my most top recommended bits because it's shaped to fit the mouth better. They're not the super thick rubber like some of the older styles, and they have a lot of different options. They even have different options on firmness for the rubber. So I like these a lot. They're very soft. Um, they're one of my favorite bits to use. This is a traditional happy mouth um, with the little peanut in the middle. The happy mouth is a plastic coated bit, so there is metal underneath. Your horse cannot chew through this all the way. Um, the problem with happy mouths is that when they do get chewed on, they can get these sharp little points that need to be filed down because it is plastic. So I personally wouldn't spend money on happy mouth again um, to buy new bits because I like trust bits better and I find that they last longer and they're softer on the mouth because it's not a hard plastic. But I'm not saying that this is a terrible bit to use. They are more affordable than the trust bits. They're just not personally my cup of tea. I have two of them as you can see. Um, in different stages of wear and they don't wear as quickly as the soft rubber bits because it is a hard plastic but like I said you have to watch them for those sharp little bits that can poke your horse's mouth. This is the Springer, um, I, I forget which one this is but it's one of their uh, copper ones with like the peanut in the middle, the lozenge in the middle um, and this one is shaped to the mouth like as you can see it's a very clear, here we'll go this way, shape. Oh, like shaped see it shapes inwards goes in like that um for a metal bit i don't mind this one i find horses like it all right but i have stopped really using metal bits um i've been using like the rubber or plastic or the rubber coated ones or straight rubber or leather ones instead so i haven't used this one in quite some time um it's not that i'd be opposed to using it i would just probably wrap it in seal text um because i'm swaying away from using uh pure metal in terms of rubber bits, these Centaur Eco Pure bits are the most cost effective. This one was $32.95 Canadian, so very, very affordable. I like these ones because for a rubber bit, they do them a lot thinner. I find some of the companies that do this type of rubber bit do them way too thick for the mouth. And they also have more mouthpiece options. So I really like the fact that they do this with the peanut in the middle. Um, the peanut doesn't dig into the tongue in the same way that a Dr. Bristol or French Link can, so that's why I prefer these. This one, as you can see, has not been used. I'm not a huge fan of loose rings because they are less stable in the mouth. However, loose rings are a good choice for a horse that is a little bit strong because since the rings rotate, it makes it a little harder to lean on. But it also means that like for a rider who has bouncy hands, the loose rings will amplify that motion. So I wouldn't recommend a loose ring to a beginner rider, but I would recommend a loose ring for someone that needs a little bit of an extra something but still wants a soft bit that is a snaffle. Okay, another loose ring. This is a bomber um, loose ring. It is shaped like the Springer. It's just not quite as shaped um, in the same way. Big lozenge for the tongue so it won't dig into the tongue and it's nice and soft and rolled rather than having like edges like a French link would. And then the bomber blue like sweet iron is supposed to be good. Horses apparently like this. Again, I haven't used this a ton because it is a loose ring and I'm not the biggest fan of a loose ring, but I like having it on hand. 
This is another Centaur Eco Pure bit. As you can see, it's been used a little more. Um, again, these bits are only $30 and I have them always last me like at least a year, even when I'm riding them on client horses, like several horses a day. So I would recommend these a lot. Same thing with the peanut in the middle, although this is an egg butt. So the egg butt rings do not rotate, they are fixed, and that means it's more stable in the mouth. So I like the egg butt or the D-ring personally for my cheek pieces, or I'll get a boche um, cheek piece. However, I don't think the EcoPure does boches with this type of mouthpiece. This is another Bomber Blue. This is a boche. Contrary to popular belief, boches do not add a leverage action. Um, as you can see, these little pieces turn out like that, and it actually relieves pull pressure. So when you pull back, it takes pressure off of the pole. So it actually does the opposite of what people claim to, which is why these bits are dressage legal. If they had a leverage action, they would not be dressage legal because you're not allowed leverage bits in dressage until you're using a double bridle, which is kind of silly. Um, they should just not have them at all, in my opinion. Dressage riders are going to come for me for saying that, but YOLO. This is one of my favorite, favorite bits. It's the Bomber Blue Flexible Mullen. I think it's excellent for young horses. It's really flexible, as you can see. And it's like a kind of rubbery material with no metal core. Um, I've used it on a lot of client horses and babies. And there are some shoe marks, but it's very, very minor. Um, and then the boche, like I said, it takes pressure off the pole. This is Harlow's bit. I got it for her because it's dressage legal. And um, she has pole sensitivity from being galloped in an elevator for most of her racing career um, for regular training, not for breezing. Um, so I got this for her and she really likes it. And I love the fact that it's dressage legal because unfortunately the straight leather bits that are the most similar to this, in my opinion, are not. Um, and it is skinnier than this guy. So for horses that have really small little mouths and low palates, this is great. Um, I would highly recommend this one. This is going to be the bit that Banksy will get for being like ground driven in when he is eventually bitted or he'll use a leather bit. But I really like this one. Um, I ordered it from horsebitbarn.ca or I think it's just bitbarn.ca. They're one of my sponsors. I'll link them in the description. So I don't own any leverage bits anymore. I got rid of like all of my elevator bits, my gag bits and stuff and pelums and stuff because I don't need them. Um, this isn't like a criticism on everyone who uses them. I just want to talk about why I stopped using them because I used to definitely defend the use of them and say that like some horses need them and that some horses are just too strong and can't go in a snaffle ever. And I no longer believe in that. Like I think that the equipment a horse needs to go in is actually what the rider needs. And that's not an insult to the rider in the sense that it's not me saying like, oh, you're a bad rider and that's why you need it. It means that you're at this stage in your training or your patience level or like what you're willing to put into work with your horse or the support you get on the outside from your trainers and role models. And you're not at the stage where you are in a position to learn how to teach the horse how to go softer in a snaffle without the help from an, a, like a stronger bit. Um, and I was in that stage for quite some time and it resulted in me like running around perpetuating the idea that like some horses needed it and that like I had really good hands and that's why like I was actually a better rider because I used this harsh bit but that was like completely false like speaking from my personal experience I ran my mouth a lot about how like I had really soft hands but truly soft hands do not feel the need to be weaponized in my opinion if your hands are soft you don't want to get a piece of equipment that makes them inherently harsher every time they're put into action simply to control the horse better that's not having soft hands like i have soft hands i don't want to put something in my horse's mouth that is going to be discomfort at I have soft, if I have soft hands, I don't want to put something in my horse's mouth that's going to be potentially uncomfortable even at rest. And I also don't want to put something in their mouth that if I were to accidentally screw up and catch them in the mouth or fall off and have them get loose and potentially step on the reins, that is going to make the problem way worse than it needs to be. And I view a lot of the types of leverage bits and quick fix options that we see recommended like that. I'm going to be doing an update to this video once I get my hands on some more of those types of bits that I don't support. I'm seeing if anyone wants to donate like nose bands or bits and kind of harsh equipment that they no longer want and don't want to sell to people because I won't put it on a real horse. It's just going to go on doornail to show people why I don't like it. So if anyone has equipment like that, feel free to email me and we can arrange getting it over here so that I can try it on him. Um, but basically, like my philosophy with bits is that I don't think under any circumstances you should be using the mouthpiece to control your horse more so for example like Waterford's 
twisted wire snaffles, slow twists, anything where it's made to be more abrasive so the horse backs off of it quicker, I think is inherently unkind because with those types of mouthpieces, you can't control the action with your hands. Like any times your hands are going into action and taking up a contact in a bit that has the mouthpiece as the abrasive action. Anytime you do that, it's going to cause discomfort. Whereas at least with like a Pelham with two reins on, you can control how much curb you're using to make it more fair to the horse. So there's more control there. Whereas in an abrasive mouthpiece, the horse can bump into it with their tongue just by chewing and moving around their mouth or opening and closing their mouth and make it uncomfortable even at rest. So I think that we really need to sway away from using those. And I don't mean any disrespect to people who still use them on their horses. I just think we need to really consider, like, first of all, how sharp the bars of the mouth are, how poorly protected they are, and how harshly the equipment we use can act on that. Because also, like, speaking from my personal experience in the past, looking at how I used to ride and also looking at studies that they've done where they've actually tested with pressure gauges how hard riders are pulling on the reins, it's been really easily depicted that most riders are pulling a lot harder than they think like we're not very good at accurately representing how harsh or soft our hands are so I think that it's better for the welfare of the horse to not advocate for types of equipment that are so easily abused and at their core the mechanics of them are specifically for using pressure and leveraging discomfort for control which is why you get that immediate response from your horse when you switch to the horse it's they obviously never open their mouth this wide when they're alive but their mouths are way more narrow and with less space than we imagine because also like look at how much space is in this mouth and then now imagine with gums and a tongue and think about how much space that would take up because the mouth itself is very narrow and then you add in the tongue and gums and you're making it even smaller. So you don't want to have like, this is also why I won't condone most ported bits unless they're ported for tongue relief. Like for horses who have really fat tongues, there's little small ports that you can get that provide tongue relief and some horses like those better. But those are different from like the Segundas or the big um, Western bits with huge ports. Because honestly, like I don't really see how a horse could actually fit that comfortably in their mouth. And that's a hill that I will die on. Um, when the port gets to a certain size, like their mouth is like anatomically not large enough to comfortably fit it. Um, and I think that seeing it in action shows people kind of like how small it is. Like there would be gums and stuff to protect this. So you're not necessarily dragging it back to the teeth every time like that. Um, but it shows how small it is. Like this bit is too small for him. Um, it would it would look different with lips and soft tissues and stuff. So I actually did find the one that I have that has tongue relief. So this is the Trust um, Innosense with tongue relief. And as you can see, it's like a small port. And instead of going directly upright, it's kind of angled because it's to accommodate the tongue. So it's not going directly upright to the roof of the mouth. It's angled so that it's going to sit more flat and flush against the tongue, but provide more space for the tongue. Whereas other ports are like directly upright, like a mountain. Um, this bridle I found a lot of thoroughbreds like. Um, it's a nice little, little bit. Um, here, I'm going to show you him with the padded sheepskin bridle on so that people can kind of get that idea. Open up, buddy. Good boy. This also shows the sheepskin bridle version that I have. This is the Harlow Lux bridle, um, the bitted version of the same bitless bridle that I showed earlier. Okay, so this is my sheepskin Harlow Lux bridle. It's the anatomical bridle, but instead of leather padding, we have sheepskin padding. For horses who have really sensitive skin, I find that this can work really well, uh, especially if they get like irritated by their own sweat. So horses that get like hives and stuff, sometimes this works better for them. And sheepskin is really good at dissipating heat. Um, surprisingly, I know people wouldn't expect that, but it's way more effective at doing it than other artificial materials. And it would dissipate heat better than a typical padded noseband would. Um, so 
here we got, you can see how it leaves the cutout for this. And also like when you have the bit on and it fits a horse properly, you might find that the sheepskin brushes against the cheekbone. But if it's the sheepskin rather than the actual padding, you're in the clear. Um, you don't want the padding to be pushing against it because the sheepskin is not going to rub. It's really soft and pliable. So that's the key. And then it also has the padded pull part and the cutout pull part for the ears. Um, and this can work really well for horses who are ear sensitive. However, not all of them will like the feeling of the sheepskin right against their ears. So I would check that first if you have a horse who is ear sensitive and I might go with the regular padded one. Or if you wanted to look into doing like a custom option, we could do a padded nose band and not do a padded crown piece with the sheepskin so that they don't get irritated by it. Um, but with that said, I've tried this one on pretty pole sensitive horses and they have enjoyed it. Um, and I haven't seen problems with it, but I'm just giving a heads up so that people don't buy something that might not work for their horse. Mouth. Way more movement in the mouth. So yeah, this is too big for him, but this shows a good, good example of how the flash works. And I have the flash done up loosely, but you can still see that he's not super able to open and close. And then the other problem with figure eights is depending on how low they're fitted, they can be fitted like way down there on the nasal bone. And then every time he's chewing, it's pulling down on the sensitive area of the nasal bone. But since this attachment is not as far forward, he does have more means of opening his jaw when it is correctly fitted and when the flash isn't too tight. But like I said, the flash still is there for the purpose of not having them move their jaw around. It also makes it harder for them to cross their jaw in this one and like grind. So for horses that really cross their jaw and gape, it would be harder in this bridle. Um, in terms of using a flash, I would say that this is honestly one of the more ethical types of bridles to use for a flash, but also the cheek rings, depending on how it's fitted, can be right up against the cheekbone. So that's definitely something to consider. Um, but I would prefer this over a regular cavasson with a flash personally. So basically like my entire goal with like making any type of equipment was to like, first of all, try to make horses more comfortable. And secondly, try to make making horses comfortable cost effective for the owners and actually attainable for them because I think so many horse companies make their prices so ridiculous that people just can't get the stuff even if they want to. So I wanted to make it affordable enough that people could save up and still get something that's nice quality but not so expensive that they can't afford it. Um, for me, like having happy horses or like having stuff that at least gives more options that are less restrictive to the horse, I think is a necessary part of the market. And obviously like from a business perspective, if I'm successful in advertising these bridles, it's a good thing. However, like my motivation isn't really making money because I could price them way higher than I did and I could be making more money, but then I would be pricing out the same types of people who were like me um, like a decade ago or like when I was like yeah growing up and wanting nice things for my horses but having to pay for them myself and I don't want to price out the very clientele that represents who I was and who I used to be in my growth as an equestrian like that would be so freaking hypocritical and like nasty like I can't do that because I didn't want people doing that to me when I was young so I really wanted to make cost effective stuff that like makes sense and can help people have like a better relationship with their horse or help make their horse more comfortable without it being a situation where you're trying to affect behavioral change in the horse by forcing them to mask behaviors with how the equipment acts with their face or their mouth and so on and so forth. Um, so that's why I really have tried to make these affordable and I love the fact that I have the skull now because I want to show different stuff and just kind of share my opinion on it so that people can learn and hopefully uh, change some outdated views if they have any and um, just be more mindful of how they fit their equipment to their horse because I definitely wasn't mindful of how I fit my equipment for a while and I used things that were negatively impacting my horse without realizing it. And it created a long-term problems that were harder to fix over time after I created like such a heavily stressed horse that all of a sudden I was fighting against all the stress that I had created. Um, and like, it's been a long time to grow and learn from that and to let go of all this stuff. And 
And, and the more that I do this and the softer I try to work to use equipment, it's taken a long time for me to grow and learn in the way that I have and to like be less rigid in like using quick fixes and stuff. Like um, initially, like I would have defended like elevator bits and stuff, like even within the last like six ish years. Um, however, like after getting Milo, I have not put like draw reins or any type of like leverage bit or anything on any of my personal horses i've been forced to sometimes ride other people's horses in equipment i don't agree with but now i'm finally at the point in my business that if someone if a client told me to i would just say no um and it's taken a long time to get there and i would have defended a lot of the equipment i now criticize i would have def defended it in the past and i want to be honest about that because defending something and believing that it works does not mean that it actually does there's an inherent bias affiliated with it, especially if you can get your horse to do things easier and bypass the struggle of like building muscle and like consistency and softness so that you can ride and jump your horse in a snaffle or bitless and so on. Um, a lot of that is just about putting the work in to do it. And honestly, speaking from experience again, all of the shortcuts and stuff that people think that their horse needs, a lot of the time they don't. And it makes the what your end goal is actually take longer. And by the time you realize that it's making it take longer, you're in so deep and you have so much baggage to undo that it is so much more work. Like you're honestly better off just preparing your horse right from the foundation and not making your relationship based off of like leveraging discomfort to control them. And I don't believe that all bits do that, which is why I wanted to show the ones that I like and use. And obviously any bit or any piece of equipment can be abused, but it's a whole lot easier to abuse certain types of equipment. And I think a lot of people way overemphasize how infallible and perfect their hands are. Um, and again, it's something that's been reflected in studies. They have even used the pressure gauge studies on like professional upper level riders and have found the same things. So using like, oh, so-and-so is a professional rider who rides Grand Prix jumping isn't an excuse to defend a bidding rig that interacts in such a way on the horse's face that they are going to be in pain. Like I showed you how the regular Cavasson impacted the ability to escape the bit. Imagine some of the show jumpers who are in like double twisted wire gag bits, like stuff that like Andy Kocher and those types of people and like um, Danny Waldman use, those types of things. A lot of those people are also using rope nose bands and flashes. The rope nose band is more abrasive, it's thinner, so the pressure is gonna be more localized on the nose. And then also the flash makes the horse, as I showed you, less able to open them out. So not only do they use these types of equipment that wildly amplify pressure from the rider's hands, they render the horse completely unable to escape from that if the pressure is too much and becomes painful, which I think shouldn't be allowed. Like if you're going to use harsh equipment that could be overused and cause your horse pain, you shouldn't be allowed to force your horse no means of escaping it. Like at the very least, they should be able to open their mouths to relieve the pressure. Otherwise, like it's it's putting riders in such a freaking it's put otherwise it's putting upper level riders on such a pedestal that we assume that they can never screw up and that they somehow have like the mind powers of knowing the second their horse is uncomfortable despite all of the signs of discomfort we see in the main show jumping ring and other rings like there's no evidence that these riders actually are caring or aware of how their equipment impacts their horse and i think the skull makes it pretty clear because he doesn't lie with how his joints work and also i can feel the resistance on the nose band when i open his mouth so it is what it is well the last thing i want to show is just the difference between like the traditional like unpadded crown piece on a bridle versus like the newer ones that are padded and have cutouts for the ears so the pole is a very sensitive place as you can see like the spine literally attaches right to where that's sitting and there's not a whole lot of padding so this type of bridle doesn't have a lot of padding and it's a thinner crown piece and there's no cutouts for the ears so when they flick their ears back they can be hitting this and then also it's going to sit heavier on their head especially if you use a leverage bit or anything that increases pole pressure when this pulls down it's going to be less padded on the head and it's going to hurt more because the pressure is more localized and there's less protection to the soft tissues of the head and neck here. Um, so it is a lot less comfortable for the horse and for their ears and whatnot. So I would sway away from this type of crown piece. I've actually found like a huge difference in one of my client horses. His halter crown piece is like this, which is really normal for halters. It's just one of the traditional breakaway nylon halters. 
um and he hates the halter like he doesn't like having his halter put on but as soon as i put on the padded monocrown bridle he lowers his head and is like way quieter and softer which personally i would have never have guessed would make that much of a difference so on the flip side here's the comparison of my bridal crown piece as you can see it cuts out for the ears here so that there's space for the ears to flick back without hitting this it is padded and much softer like probably at least twice as thick in padding and then the ear cutout makes a huge difference so then if even if you ride in a leverage bit if this is pulling down on the head it is more protected and it's going to be less painful Just to give you a better look at the cheekbones and how sharp they are, like look at how much that sticks out. And when horses have skin, these aren't very protected by soft tissue structures like skin. Um, it's a very thin skin that covers this and it's very sharp, like there's an edge to that. Um, so their cheekbones are sharp and it's not surprising to me that some horses get rubs from bridles, especially after seeing just how sharp it is. Then again, you can see the cheekbone and how it sticks out. Very cool. And then also we'll go to the top of the head and you can see here where the ears and stuff would come out. You can see all these little holes where nerves run out of them. And really cool, hey? This is where the mandibular nerve would run out of, I think, because um, there's a hole on either side and that looks like where it would be when they have flesh on. Don't quote me on that, I am not a vet, but I'm pretty sure that's it. The mandibular nerve is also where a lot of curb straps will sit. So if you use like a Kimberwick or a Pelham, a lot of them will sit directly against this nerve. So if you do use a bridle like that, I would recommend using a padded curb strap or wrapping it in seal text or something just to make it more comfortable. Or I would recommend trying to slowly sway away from using those types of bits. And then also here you can see just how sharp the bars are they're even sharper than the cheekbones if i had like a piece of cheese i could probably cut it on this um and then i just had to check with my vet how much of this is remodeling from potential bit use and how much of it is actually the normal structure and of course there would be gum on top of that but showing how sharp the bone is shows how irritating it could be for something to pull hard against the gums like that do you like my shitty green screen um i bought one and it's not properly set up and i was just too lazy because it kept falling down so um i'm not a real youtuber we've established that i'm just a mess but um anyways yeah so this isn't an anti-bit video it's just about potentially reconsidering equipment that you've had normalized to you over years because it is a factor in like human psychology that like you can become desensitized to things that are problematic if you see them in front of you all the time and become used to it and unfortunately a lot of equestrians are used to seeing chronically stressed horses and chronically in pain horses so they have less of a realistic gauge of like what a truly stressed horse looks like and they're more likely to look at a stressed horse and go oh no he's fine because he's not actively freaking out meanwhile the horse can be showing all sorts of subtle signs of pain and distress so that's all i'm saying and it's this is not to criticize anyone's practices just to kind of share information and my thoughts on things i'm not a veterinarian obviously but um again like the effects of the bit and the mechanics of the bit they're not something you can really argue when you're just talking about the physics of certain bits and how they work and how and why they work and i think that more people need to be considerate of that because we shouldn't be putting our horses in a position where we're like leveraging their discomfort so that we can control them and ride them more and enjoy them more and if we do that we can't honestly lie and say that they like their job so if anyone is interested in any of my bridles they're available on this website amore equestrian um amore equestrian is owned by one of my friends cali a canadian owned company they ship out of alberta we ship worldwide um a lot of the bridles are selling out or sold out but we will be doing a restock soon i just want to preface this with the fact that when we do restock they usually sell out pretty fast because like i said i'm a singular person i can't do large large sample size orders I don't have any investors I'm paying for this all myself and it is very hard so um they are smaller and it's not for me to like try to tease you guys it's because I literally cannot afford to restock them in the way large companies do because I am not yet a large company um so bear with me we're gonna try to restock more so that there's gonna be more consistent stock and less selling out but this is like a new venture for me so please be understanding um shipment times vary it's also a learning curve for the people who make my bridles because it is different and it's a custom style so they had to learn how to do all of that and as they learn and get better at it they get faster but um 
right now like there can be a wait period for restocking and also like the amount that I do get restocked is completely reliant on what I can afford at any given time so uh, I appreciate all the interest and the love that I've gotten with the bridles so far we do have some of the sheepskin styles still in stock and a couple of sizes of the plain leather padded bitted bridle the Harlow bridle but there's not very many left so I would highly recommend shopping soon if you want a sheepskin one because those ones are restocking a little bit later i should be restocking the plain leather padded ones within the next week or two so stay tuned about that i will post something in the couple days before they are going live so that people can prepare but like i said i cannot afford to order in like crazy large quantities of like thousands of bridles like some large companies do um so just keep in mind that they probably will sell out fairly fast again until i can actually afford to do more stock but i am trying and i'm working on it thank you for watching i hope that this was educational and not too confusing i'm going to be doing another one soon as i get more equipment that i do not like and don't support and then i can show you more variety on mr doornail and shout out to Dornail for being such a good specimen. We love him. He's a good boy. Good boy.